All right, so we got a number of different wallet providers here. Uh, I think a good way for us to kick things off is if we could just all go around and talk about who we are uh, and what our wallet service is. So um, um, Thomas, co-founder of Ledger, uh, so we designed a Ledger Nano S, which is a hardware wallet that is uh, quite popular in the space. Um, well, the idea is that um, private keys are in the crypto space are like digital bear bond, and you need to have like some um, ways to make sure that the keys are secure in full isolation to the network, and we provide a solution that is well simple enough for users who have some crypto to uh, sleep well at night. Hi, I'm Taylor. I'm from MyCrypto, and oh. we are. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we are. We have a website, and we have a desktop application, and it's basically a way of creating a new wallet. Um, you can obviously send your ether and your tokens from wallet and wallet to another, and then you can do some other advanced functionality like interact with smart contracts, um, get an ENS donate domain, and other things like that. My name is Donnie Dinch from Bitsky, and we are a hosted wallet SDK. So a little contrarian to the contrarian of the decentralized idea. But um, on one side for consumers, we provide a very easy cross-platform, cross-device accessible wallet that any developer can drop in with a few lines of code. And then on the other side, and our primary focus is on developer tools, and we actually have a hosted wallet for developers that um, they can connect to specific products that they're building and execute programmatic transactions. Hi, uh, my name is Dan Finlay. I work on MetaMask. It's a browser extension, uh, primarily for Ethereum websites. Uh, we, we allow web developers an API so they can interact with user accounts and uh, suggest uh, transactions and create kind of interactive experiences around their uh, contracts. And we're, uh, we're a portable code base, so we are expanding into other platforms at the moment. All right, thanks, guys. Um, so I think what we should start off talking about is that you know, we all want to see crypto get mass adoption, right? And these average Joe users, they're going to be interacting with your platforms. They store their crypto in their wallet. So how do you guys make your products both user friendly with a great user experience, but at the same time maintain that extreme level of security that's required in the cryptocurrency space? Anyone can talk about that maybe. It'd be nice. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think we all know. <laughs> Every one of us uh, knows how uh, potentially miserable the user experience is of these uh, digital bearer bonds. Um, for the first time, you know, you, we we are not holding your funds. First of all, we're holding at most your private keys, and uh, it, to varying degrees of that, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we're giving you different options of how you keep them. But uh, yeah, the the cool thing about crypto, yeah, giving us the power to take this private key, this little secret information, and decide where it goes. So what's like the most, what's the best place to put it? What's the most user-friendly place with the best benefits, with the best security? And you end up making a lot of trade-offs. You end up saying like, where do I want to fall for my users between usability and, uh, and security? Uh, it's basically the big trade-off. And so at MetaMask, we started uh, kind of somewhere in the middle. We're like the browser extension to hold your keys. And then we're gradually, you know, we're adding ledger support. And so we're increasing security, but then you know, there's, there's always people that, you know, like, I, I don't know if uh, Bitsky is going to make it a service or what, but, you know, there's, there's other approaches of having hosted keys, and uh, maybe, maybe that's the best first user experience, and we gradually upgrade or something like that. That's kind of what we've been thinking about lately. Like, when do you raise the stakes? Can we minimize uh, friction at first and then only increase security as needed? Yeah, I think, I think all of that makes perfect sense. I, I think the big thing for us is, I mean, obviously, first and foremost, we kind of shape every decision at Bitsky. Like, how do we, how could we, and we'll be a service to the wallet SDK, and like, how do we power the first million DAU product that interacts with the blockchain? And to get a lot of people on it, you have to, you have to make, a, I guess, some pretty big user experience jumps. And, uh, but I think the most important thing is providing optionality. And so um, while we're providing a hosted experience and we're, you know, we're storing these private keys in very secure hardware security modules, um, we're not religious about storing these keys. Eventually, we will support a user bringing their own wallet. But um, I think that some of these trade-offs, some of these, I guess, 
uh, considerations that need to be made in order to smooth the adoption curve to really reach a large audience. And so I think we've seen a lot of amazing products built on you know, very crypto native products, whether it be games or dApps. And I think those have all done really well in our community, but there's a, whole, like a much larger, I think, uh, pie that we can go after. And to the extent that we can make usability and onboarding for these wallets much, much easier, I think we have a much higher chance of getting a massive adoption. So one thing I've been thinking a lot about is, you know, since we are integrated with Ledger, we're integrated with Trezor, we're integrated with MetaMask, is um, when a person is holding their own private key, and if they're like entering it on a website or on the desktop app, or they're storing it on their computer or their phone, like up until what point is that safe? And then just like Dan was talking about this sort of like uh, concept of leveling up, like having a user level up, like it's probably okay for a user to get familiar with crypto um, by experimenting with private keys and having this control and playing around and generating new wallets and kind of using that experience to um, get familiar with the, the whole crypto scene. Uh, but at some point when they are holding just a buttload of funds in here, like someone does need to tell them, hey, you really need to stop doing what you're doing. Like that should be either a fully cold wallet or, you know, a solution like Ledger. Um, and, and we're thinking a lot about this because we do just provide so many ways for people to access their wallet through, through our application. And um, one of the things I think we're gonna do is actually just like literally tell the user that, hey, if you have like a certain amount of ETH, like just start throwing warnings at them over and over and over again and educating them and making opinionated choices like sort of for them and say, hey, look, you've been playing with crypto, you've been having a good time, you've got some like digital trading, trading cards, whatever it is, but now it's time to get serious. Like, you know, there, it's so easy to make a mistake in this, in this space. Here's your other options that are gonna allow you to be safer. And I'm, I'm hoping that that's going to be, you know, a positive thing for this entire ecosystem. Yeah, so we're really focused on the, um, <clears throat> on the vault side. So uh, uh, Ledger is really about like keeping your, your, your private key the safest way possible, like on this, offline device. So <clears throat> I really see it as a, as a good setup for people to, to, to be their own bank and to, uh, to have like the good security foundation to then like go and play around on, on, on different stuff. So um, I don't see like people uh, like uh, Ledger is really uh, for desktop use it right now. Um, and, uh, and people go on our interface, it's mostly like to, to have the vault product. If you want more usability on different chain or like on, on Ethereum to interact with smart contracts. So they would go like on, on my crypto and they would go on, uh, on, uh, on MetaMask. So I, I guess we're focused on the good foundation um, and then working with other players to, to, to get like the, the different experience for the different chains that you have. So like I've noticed that we have uh, like some of you guys are you're all across the spectrum like Ledger, you're you're allowing people to be your own bank while some some other people like uh, you know it's more of a hot wallet and you know there's there's other services where your private key is managed like when you have a Coinbase wallet or something like that like what direction do you see this space going do you think that maybe there'll be services that will almost like hold ledgers and 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 ha and having like private key management would be a service or do you think uh, most people are going to end up being their own bank like what direction do you guys see this space going I'll just start with saying it kind of goes back to optionality. I think when you were speaking a second ago, it kind of reminded me of like a, the difference when you were a kid and you had a piggy bank, but then you don't like put your salary in your bedroom. Like, like there's like there's other people that are in, in a specialized economy that become really good at handling those type of things. And so I think it comes back to optionality. I think that um, I, I, listen, I, I'm sure we've all built software before, um, started a company before. It's really hard to get users. It's really hard to get people to install things just when they just have to install it from the app store, uh, just when they have to type in the, like, the URL for the website. Um, if we want to see some sort of Cambrian explosion, there's going to have to be some shims in place. I think that's like my, my, my perspective, but I don't think that that's kind of the end all to be all. I think that um, they're kind of, it's kind of like the piggy bank, and eventually as you get more assets, as you get more understanding and experience in the space, then you have different directions that you can go, whether it be Ledger, uh, you can stick with MetaMask, you can, I don't, I mean, whatever. I mean, we're still very much in the infrastructure stage too, so we're all obviously building something similar but very unique, and I'm sure that'll continue for a little while as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. So yes, all that. So. So. Uh, yeah. We're just. I think there's a theme that we're kind of just hitting repeatedly. This. This like kind of gradual onboarding. And I think there's really a uh, space for a big plurality of these. And. And I think that a lot of DApps are exploring a ton of them. A lot of the options 
um, be it a drop in library that lets you just get users as soon as possible with a familiar experience, uh, or whether you're gradually upgrading their, uh, their capabilities. Um, one cool thing that I'm looking forward to in the next year uh, is that as uh, contract accounts become more common, I think that it's going to be increasingly common to have, let's say, an app key associated with a site or service that you're at. And so they may hold a key entirely. Uh, they, they might have a hosted one, and just a smart contract might enforce the security of that. So, so then what you get to do is you get to say, like, well, what are the levels of security that my various like, keys need? And maybe we need to work on the verbiage of that because you know, key is still kind of this like cryptographic legacy wording, um, but, uh, but, but the fact that you can isolate it, you can say like, look, I could have my recovery life savings key, and that could be like a, a four or five that I scatter around the world like a bunch of horcruxes, uh, or, or I could just have my like daily spending limit thing, or, you know, or my kid could just have a little allowance account, or, uh, you know, uh, my Netflix has $10 a month or whatever. Yeah, also, I think it would be sad to re-centralize everything, saying that uh, you go through like trusted custodian for everything. Um, I think um, everybody's focused on building the, the best possible product right now and the best possible like building blocks to, uh, to do something different. So uh, custodian are great because you, you can um, basically delegate some... Uh, some you, you have a governance, so you, you know that uh, uh, if somebody's going to send like a million dollars from your account, uh, they are going to call you or they're going to do something and they're going to revert the, 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 the transaction back. So it, it, there's some aspect that can be good, but I guess there's also some stuff that you can do it uh, without uh, the need for this uh, trusted custodian. So you can just have a custodian to store like part of your keys, for example, but you keep like uh, most of them so that you don't rely totally on them. Uh, you can imagine having some uh, some transaction where <coughs> uh, you can enforce a solution where if you uh, have a transaction over a certain amount, you would require to have like a, an authorization from uh, your lawyer or your wife or somebody else. So it's about also building ways to, to, to have some governance models that is enforced by the user that don't necessarily uh, need to rely on this third party custodian. And um, yeah, re-centralization, uh, Ending up all this thing by re-centralizing re everything would be kind of sad. In my yeah, opinion. no, I completely agree. And that's what I think one of the biggest things that I sort of have to find the balance for when I'm making product decisions is, you know, how do you, like, we're completely dedicated to keeping things decentralized. We have no interest in holding people's keys for them. And so if we have decided that, then how the heck do we make this whole thing usable? And when I talk about usability, I'm, I'm not really talking about, like, uh, like design and, like, I, the onboarding modals and, and those types of things. Like, I'm really talking about how can you like go out on a random street like or even out on a San Francisco street and like grab someone who doesn't really know much about crypto but has some interest in it and actually get them to successfully um, buy some crypto, hold it in their wallet and do so securely and safely and with like an understanding and with confidence. And I think that we're so far away from that experience at this point. And in order to really encourage like that mass adoption or to get to that mass adoption, um, all of us have to figure out um, what that sort of solution looks like and how do we balance um, you know, putting the power in the people's hands and sticking to the core tenets of decentralization and, and, and the blockchain, um, and, but also make it usable. So I think that there's a lot of, of, of different solutions and a lot of different directions that we can go in. And I think that the more people in this space and the more players building in this space, the better it's going to be. Um, you know, I get asked a lot, um, you know, like if I'm, there, people assume that like we compete with MetaMask like all the time, and I'm always just kind of like laugh, and I say like no, like we work really well together, like as in terms of our products, but also in terms of our teams, because it's massively important in these early days that we're all building on top of each other and working together to get this entire space moving in a forward, easy to use, accessible direction. Yeah, because we're pretty close, pretty far away from having something that is a. Uh, uh, easy to onboard and then uh, even if you're on board what do you do with it uh, i mean like the, uh, <laughs> yes. the, the use cases today are fairly fairly limited and um and so all this will also be use case driven in a way that uh, maybe you'll have something around gaming where you'll have a, a lot of traction or well, because the scale is of a, a chain is scalable enough to handle all that or uh, well, if you have that, then 
then you, you start to have a use case and you can piggyback on that use case and, and uh, you'll have different experience different, uh, depending on where you're focusing in. So, for example, for gaming, it would be like a, uh, yeah, microtransaction uh, uh, and maybe as soon as you got like over a certain threshold of amount, then you could make a withdrawal to a, war a warm wallet where you have a bit more security, you've got multi-sig, stuff like that. And if, if you go uh, uh, over a certain threshold, then you go to like a colder storage or whatever. So it's, it's really depending on the, what use case are going to emerge. And, uh, and, uh, and the UX will also depend on, on these type of use case because having like a universal wallet that is going to work for everything on mobile, on web, on desktop, um, yeah, I don't think so. It's, it's not going to be like that universal. It will be very use case driven. I, th I think a nice point that you're, you guys are making is that there's something inherently portable about accounts in the blockchain space. So it's like all of our products are potentially completely interoperable, like because a person could sign into an app, they could make their first key maybe with BitSkey, and then maybe they migrate it into a MetaMask, and then maybe they switch it over to their ledger, and then they use uh, my crypto to like, you know, as their interface, right? Like, and there's, there's something cool about uh, the platform that we're building on where it's a shared computer and the notion of an account is this such abstract externalized thing, this secret that we can just all just you know, throw spaghetti at the wall and they all just already work together. Like we don't even, it's like we don't even, you know, I, we haven't coordinated before, right. but like uh, our, our pieces are already intercompatible and like right. I'm already like, oh yeah, I, I can see exactly how we would uh, integrate. <laughs> like, so that's, that's a cool part about this space and ecosystem, and, and I like when those synergies naturally evolve, and, uh, and that kind of user optionality is, it's a natural feature of it. Like, we're not even doing that. That's just a nature of cryptography. Yeah. So another thing I wanted to talk about, just like in terms of adoption, is the concept of like a blockchain naming service. Like when you think about when you Venmo somebody, no one says like, oh yeah, like send it to like 0x, 3f, 5bb, whatever, like, you know, how, do you guys plan on incorporating blockchain naming services? Are you planning on incorporating that in terms of usability? Like when someone first creates their MetaMask, maybe MetaMask could purchase uh, a, blockchain naming, a blockchain name for them if that's available, like something like that. Is that anything you guys think about in terms of adoption? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we've integrated ENS to, to some degree. You can enter ENS names in MetaMask and send to them. Um, but that still isn't, doesn't feel like the most dns -y thing. Like maybe we should set up uh, initially. I, I honestly think for a Venmo-like experience, you need like a notion of a friends list. Like, because the, the, the chance of mistyping is just so huge. Like ENS names are great for, yeah, having like a human readable. Like I, I especially like it for URL bar or like get yeah, resourcing things and subdomaining things. But yeah, for your friends, like I don't know if you want to type, you know, like, oh, dan.metamask. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, but, but the notion of just having a friends list seems very natural, and I, I think abstracting away the, the technicality and the addresses even uh, makes a lot of sense to me in the long term. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think we look at maybe ENS as something that's it's a relatively niche use case. Like if I want to donate to the Red Cross or something, like maybe there's an, e an easy one. But for the most part, I mean, if you look at our devices right now, I bet you don't, like I don't even know my wife's f phone number anymore like it's just it's just managed by this third party contact list and i imagine that that's probably the way things will go um again optionality as users have more demand for something like this i think we'd love to support it but haven't seen it quite yet yeah the ens has like a lot of um uh, there's a lot of, of work to do the ens as a core concept and as a sort of protocol and, and the auction mechanisms and the stuff that went into the smart contracts for the ENS are really, really strong. But again, it's a perfect example of how the blockchain space is uh, like we have such we have such strong fundamentals and such strong like smart contracts and, and uh, game theory and, and token economics and all this stuff. But what does it actually look like for the end user? And I think in my opinion, the ideal experience for the end user is like yeah, they just like get a name or they just have this thing and it's this, this thing that travels with them and it's just magical and they can tell their friends like, hey, here's this human readable name and there's no, it just removes all this friction. Um, one of the hard things in, you know, to, to accomplish that is how much lives on the blockchain, how much doesn't live on the blockchain. If it doesn't live on the blockchain, how do you carry that name from my crypto to MetaMask or you know, how, does, how does an exchange or how does Bisky also know about that? 
And um, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot with the ENS and sort of like naming and, and that kind of stuff is the privacy concerns of the blockchain in general. So ideally, like if 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 I'm just thinking about myself as a uh, regular person, if a if a site asks me to create a username, I use typically like one or two of the same usernames, and because of that, I'm very easy to connect from one site to another. But um, do I really want to use that same username on the blockchain where it's immutable? It's going to be there forever. It's also going to be tied to my Ethereum address, which is also tied to like. I don't know, my finances. So if I'm not really, really educated and um, not actively taking pers personal measures to maintain my privacy, I could very easily get an ENS name that is um, like the screen name that I use everywhere else. And then all of a sudden, not only do you know like, hey, like that's her LinkedIn and that's her Twitter, but hey, this is how much she makes a month. Uh, she likes to, you know, uh, go on spank chain in her downtime, like, you know, like all these different things. And, and that's one of the big concerns. And so I don't know how we're going to solve this, but I do think that in the future, we are going to have to abstract away addresses. And I think it's, we could either go down like the ENS style path, or we could go down a more, um, maybe like your contact list or your address book in your phone where it's it's just this thing that you can import, you can export. Somehow we all magically get it from one phone to the next, but it's not stored on the blockchain. And it will be great as, uh, as standards emerge so that uh, we don't do all uh, our own standards because uh, yeah, there's ENS and after for other chains, how do you do? So uh, I know there's a bunch of initiatives in that, so we'll see how the traction goes. and. And yeah, as soon as there's some uh, uh, well, people requiring these type of features uh, more and more, then, uh, then we'll go for it. But um, yeah, right now it's a bit early. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've been talking a bit about uh, providing users optionality, right? Like, do you want to be your own bank? Do you want to have a custody service? Um, but sometimes you give them options and they don't like fully understand what the options are. I mean, when you go onto My Ether Wallet now, you have to click through like 10 pages confirming that you understand that My Ether Wallet is not a bank. So what kind of uh, like, uh, frustrations have you guys dealt with? And like, what have you done to try and get people to fully understand the implications of what they're doing, like saving their private keys in a safe spot and things of that nature? So I'll start because I actually designed and made that 10-page onboarding model. Uh, it was about 3 a.m. in Ireland over Thanksgiving break. I remember it like, you know, really, I just, I have such a perfect memory of it because it was in direct response to the overwhelming number of support tickets we were getting at the time of people that were not backing up their keys properly, like were not saving their keys, had lost their keys, um, or had otherwise lost their money due to scams or phishing websites or things of that nature. And so if you like actually read that onboarding modal, um, my crypto, we have a much shorter version that's been cleaned up and isn't as angry uh, because I have a team of great people now that kind of moderate me. It's fantastic. Um, but if you if you read that, it's... it's um, I kind of describe it as like we're, we're like hit, like we have a big old wrench and I'm just like hitting users over the head and I'm like, hey, don't give away your private key. Don't lose your private key. We're not a bank and like all these things. And you know, when I took a step back and kind of looked at what we were doing and what we were telling users and what we were saying, I also realized that we were kind of inherently having users do the things that we were telling them not to do. So a perfect example of this is we allowed users to copy and paste their private key onto our website. Um, but then we would also tell them, not even tell them, we would like yell at them, hey, don't ever enter your private key on a website and also check the URL and also check the SSL cert. And one of the, like, the big decisions that we made on my crypto recently was we decided to basically not allow users to enter their private key on the web. And this was, it's one of those decisions that doesn't, it, it, it feels wrong because that, that's adding friction. Now they have to download this desktop application or now they have to get a ledger device or now they have to get MetaMask. And so we're actually adding friction to the process. But in the long run, it's going to save so many, much money and so many lost funds and so many sad people because we're just like telling them like, this is how the world works now. And I think that it's massively important that we don't only tell people what to do and like try to educate them, but we also like build our products in a way that guides them on this path inherently. So instead of like telling people, don't put your private keys on a website, that's dangerous. We're just like, yeah, don't like, don't do that ever. Like we don't ever give them the option. 
And, and I think this is, this is just one little example, but it can be applied to a ton of different things in the space. Is like, we really have to stop telling users what to do and like just guide them and hold their hand and, and drag them into this crazy future that we're building. I'll just come in really quick because we're right on the cusp of launch, so I don't have any horror stories yet for support. <laughs> um, but uh, I've, I've read a lot of other people's, so God bless you. Uh, but I think for us, I think we think about it in very similar terms. Um, almost, I mean, if you go back to like the child with a piggy bank, like to try to explain to a child what a bank is, is ridiculous. And I think that the way that you learn about a bank is through like contextual awareness. You start to use funds, you start to realize I can't fit all this in my piggy bank. Like there's like these like kind of like analogies that come into play. And so for us from a software perspective, from user experience perspective, we kind of think about it as progressive disclosure. And so um, early on, if you're, say, say that, you know, tomorrow Epic Games calls and they want to, you know, tokenize all their assets and they're like, we need to drop in the Bitsky SDK. And I'm like, perfect, great, let's do it. But they don't need to explain to all their users immediately what that means. They don't need to, like, users immediately don't need to understand that, oh, my assets are tokenized, I can sell these, I have liquidity. But um, the minute they want to do that, then we can kind of explain. And I think there's a lot of these different use cases and paths that you go down where um, you have to, you kind of have to develop an understanding with the user of what they're doing. And uh, this, the same way that you're kind of, I guess, now not allowing anyone to see their private key uh, or paste into a website, um, I think that's another kind of method of, of you know, progressive disclosure. So I, I think to the extent that, you know, people do that and, and you know, there's a lot of different variations and uh, degrees of it, but that's kind of how we're thinking about it. Yeah, um, just kind of going back to the, uh, the, the the hellfire of experience. Uh, um, I, I wanted to ask real quick, uh, in this room, are, are there anybody, is, is there anyone working on a wallet or trying to implement a wallet right now? Just, yeah, okay, a bunch, yeah, because that's what our audience would be here. Um, yeah, so, so let me just say unequivocally, just <laughs> echoing what Taylor said, uh, people will mess up however you let them. They will lose everything. They will, they will forget that they wrote it down. They will, they will blame you. <laughs> they will come to you. They will send you emails. They will find your personal accounts. Okay. Um, anyways, uh, so, so just don't let them make mistakes. Yeah, like yeah. Taylor removed a, a very powerful feature from, from her software. Uh, we, we recently actually added considerable friction to MetaMask 2, our, our new UI. Uh, you used to be able to copy the seed phrase and on the next screen paste it. Guess what everyone did? They just copy and paste it and then not paste it anywhere That's else. That's what I did. Yeah, we, we just raised that. Yeah, of course you did. And, and I just clicked through all her screens. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but like, so, so what we're doing is like, I, I don't even bother trying to inform them. I, yeah, just give them no choice. Just, just like make sure. So what we've done is you can't paste it. You play a puzzle game and you have to click the names in order. So uh, yeah, that's friction. And we, we might you know, move that a little later in the onboarding. Like maybe you don't have to back it up right away. But uh, like I, I just heard a, a cool idea uh, uh, from the Gopher, uh, Gopher app team, another uh, subscription-based wallet that's not here, uh, where they're thinking maybe make them back up when they first want to copy their address, which I thought was a really novel idea. Because basically, they're, they're like, you can have an account. You can play around. You can do whatever you want. But the moment you want to make that account worth anything, boom. Now, you, now you're forced to do something that makes sure that you know, the power is in your hand and you, you know, can't blame us later on. Um, but because even yeah, the, if you yeah. don't force people to to do the the sanity things that you need to do for your for your crypto, um, well, they just don't do it. Like I, I remember, like for example, I think it was on bread. Um, well, it, you, you you could use it, and then they were forcing you like to make a backup after. But still, some people were making a transaction, and then uh, yeah, the phone got deleted, and they, they, mm -hmm. they cry and, and it's horrible. <laughs> and, they yell, um, and for us, so it does, um, the onboarding process adds a lot of friction, so you write down 24 words, and then you have to put the 24 words uh, in order on the device, so it's, uh, yeah, it's a huge friction, and it's, uh, it sucks in terms of UX, uh, but at least we are sure that somebody has written down uh, uh, the 24 words, and even that, you don't know if the guy has written down his 24 words, uh, on his, uh, well, Evernote uh, with uh, his username and uh, a password 1234. Uh, so he just like uh, loses everything, like uh, the same thing. So 
Yeah, there's still some friction. People will always screw up. I think r we try to do with the current state of the technology, like the, the best possible solution. Um, it takes some time to to think of ways to uh, yeah, cut the keys, uh, find some scenarios where you can uh, um, have some easier onboarding, um, and that's uh, where we we'll all be working on uh, facilitating this uh, this onboarding stuff. Um, but yeah, you really need to force the user to to go the the the. Well, the, the the typical sanity check or else well they, yeah. they will screw up yeah if you're if you're just developing a wallet right now I just want to like emphasize whatever you're doing when you're testing that flow so whether that's copying and pasting the private key copying and pasting the the mnemonic phrase not writing it down like if you're able to go through that process really quickly without actually backing up your phrase every single one of your users will do that and then they will lose their money and then they will yell at you so you have to like literally you can't even let yourself take these shortcuts and you have to be really really self-aware of like oh um if i'm able to do this the users will do this they will always take like the path of least resistance and and it will turn out bad and i can tell you that early days the user interface for for generating a new, a new wallet looked like this you had a password field and you had a button. It was so simple, it was so beautiful. It was just like one of those things that, um, it was so innocent and naive, but it was great. You just landed on our site. Like we didn't, we didn't, we didn't throw like anything at you. We were just like, hey, you want a wallet? Here you go. So you press the generate button and uh, it would just give you everything. It gave you your private key, it gave you a paper wallet version of it, it gave you your address, it had a little icon for your address. It was beautiful, it was so simple. Like we didn't make you do anything. And it was like one of the best user experience ever because the amount of like friction and shit that we threw at you was like literally non-existent. And uh, that worked really well for like two months when everyone in the space was really, 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 really technical and they had already gone through a number of technical steps to attain a, a Ethereum in the pre-sale. And uh, about the third month, we started getting reports of, I didn't save my private key. I didn't print out my paper wallet. Or like, I printed out 10 paper wallets, but none of them line up to the address that I actually sent money to. You know, the, the, the amount of ways that people can screw things up is, is really phenomenal. Like, they are exceptionally creative at doing the wrong thing or the easiest thing. So just be really mindful of that. And like, don't allow any shortcuts at all. So you guys just talked about like uh, a lot of the issues people are facing and a lot of the problems that, that come from being your own bank. And I just want to play devil's advocate for a little bit here. You know, like it, using all of your services does require some level of trust. Like I have no idea how a ledger works. I have no idea if it's actually secure or not. I just trust that if I keep my life savings in there and I keep it in like, you know, like hidden in the mountains in Malaysia or something that it's going to be safe forever. And I'm curious, like, what is actually better about these solutions? Uh, I mean, in like a, a third world country, like yes, like when the government just prints money at will, like it's very clear cut use case. But in a country uh, where we are right now, where it's a pretty reasonable solution to leave your money in, in, in a checking account, like wh why are you guys actually a better solution? Great question. I, I, th I think Ledger is trusted because um, it doesn't require that much trust, so people can uh, well kind of verify by themselves, and uh, and after trust is given like by the community of users that have uh, tested the product and uh, and uh, figured out that uh, well they have not lost their money, um, and and again like um, even if Ledger goes out of uh, out of uh, out of business and it goes bust or whatever, we get uh, arrested by. Uh, the entire team got arrested or killed. Um, well, you still have the the the, the 24 words. You still have a backup. You still have the device where you can, uh, well, have access to it. So, uh, um, making sure that we do not have access to the keys uh, is something very important to 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 gain that trust. And it's the same, I guess, for at least uh, Taylor and, and Dan. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the same for us. I mean, so I, I might be one of the only people on the panel that's not an engineer, but I just I have no idea how any of these things work for the most part. I mean, I, I mean, I understand like spatially, like I could, I could draw a diagram for people, but I mean, I'm not auditing code. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing code reviews. Like, so I, I think inherently it, it all, it all requires trust. And I mean, for being completely honest from a normal user's perspe like experience perspective, it's the same as a bank. Like I, I assume the bank is doing what they say they're doing. And then only do we find out in like a class action lawsuit or something that they're not. And so just, I guess arbitrarily, I think the reason that Oh, sorry. Uh, I think the I think the reason that we're doing this, and the, I think not 
Bitsky, but just building these wallets is I think it just it allows people to own assets in a different way. And I think whether it's a currency, whether it's an actual like a digital good that you can provably own, I think that's incredibly powerful and something that we haven't had before. Um, so, and I don't think banks are going to provide that anytime soon. Um, that's why we're doing it. Yeah, uh, I think that the the trust problem with software and computers in general is huge. I, I don't know if you guys were seeing that uh, story about like the grain of rice sized microchip into you know that got into the supply chains of Apple and other uh, things and supposedly mm -hmm. supposedly got access to a lot of these major corporate servers. Like the notion that supply chains could be compromised means that like even even hardware could be suspect. And so I, I kind of think that you know there's there's a double edged sword here where like we we are gradually moving moving out and kind of uh, moving trust towards the edges and reducing the number of contact points of trust. Like, like yeah, you're still going to trust your operating system. Uh, you're still going to trust the whoever made your computer and, uh, you know, your eyes for now. And uh, um, but but we're going to gradually, uh, you know, since the, the by the nature of the portability of the keys, we can gradually move them to places that we trust more. So maybe there's increasingly you know uh, audited or and, and transparent you know hardware wallets and things like that like like metamask we we are a trust point when you're storing your keys in us but we are try to add features like hardware wallet support so you can kind of bypass that as long as you review your transactions but uh but yeah, I, I mean, when, when you get into like, oh yeah, you, you know, you have to trust, uh, we're a browser extension, so you have to trust the entire browser extension distribution pipeline, uh, you have to trust your browser vendor, you have to trust, yeah, uh, on and on down the chain. And as these networks, I think, start to accrue more and more value, the, big, the bigger each one of those kind of trust centers becomes of a honeypot, and the more important it is that we do kind of reduce and minimize them. So it may not seem like a big deal today, like, uh, like I think the first wave, you know, people storing private keys on their phones is like the obvious uh, duh thing. Uh, you know, these phones that are manufactured by who knows what. Um, but but as it approaches a, a you know an environment where like more and more of the economy is resting on that, uh, yeah, I think we have to we have to address that more head on. Yeah, I completely agree, and um, I think when we look at the the, the far future. Um, I think the key is going to be decentralizing like the trust points themselves. So, um, you know, on our site, you have to, like if you're on our website uh, and you're on our website, like when you could enter your private key, you're relying on um, the internet itself. You're relying on the, the, that the DNS system that operates the entire internet is serving you the site <laughs> that we think that we're serving you. You have to trust us that we're actually serving you this site that we say we're serving you. Uh, that it's the same code that's been audited by the security auditors and also is open source on GitHub. You have to serve. You have to trust the 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 CDN that we use to serve this website to you via GitHub, and on and on and on. And then you also have to trust that like there's no malicious browser extensions and that you didn't accidentally mistype the URL or click a, a malicious link or you know, that you don't have malware installed on your computer that, you know, affects your clipboard. Like, there are so many things. And so when I look at the future, and, and especially after some recent, like, very sophisticated attacks, um, I think that the we have to just know in our souls that, like, the Internet is insecure. The Internet as a whole is insecure. And if you're on an Internet-connected device, like, it can be insecure. So if we assume that and we have that knowledge, then we say, okay, so how do you, how do you ensure that you personally and your funds are personally secure? And I think the answer is you have to have multiple things and you have to spread out the attack surface. And you basically have to say, instead of having this one fail point, and, and on any website or any application, there are multiple failure points. Instead of doing that, you say, okay, an attacker has to successfully attack this and this and this, all at the same time, compromise all three of these things that are spread out in order to get my funds. And so I think that the future, you know, that may be like a multi-sig type situation where you have one key on your computer, you have one on your phone, you have one backed up in a safe. It may look like some integration with Ledger. Um, it may be that Ledger is like one of your keys or something. And I don't think that every single person is going to always use this solution. But I do think for, for people with a good amount of funds, um, these types of really sophisticated high-end solutions are going to be a thing. And in the same vein, you know, for those people that have just like 
uh, like say like play money, like right? Like I have my MetaMask, one of my MetaMask accounts has like, I don't know, less than 0.01 ETH. And I use it for like random DAP interactions and testing. That doesn't need to be secured with like five different devices and spread across the world. Like it's okay if I've copied and pasted that key because the worst thing that can happen is I lose five bucks or whatever. Um, so, so this whole spectrum of solutions and the whole spectrum of like the ultimate multi-sig cold storage thing all the way to the, to the really, really easy to use or even like a third party custody solution where, you, you know, you're like, hey, I'm going to trust you that you're doing the thing. And hey, if, if you don't do that thing, um, it's okay because I lost five bucks. The problem I think is when people are relying on, uh, maybe relying on the wrong solution for the wrong amount of money. And I think that's one thing that, that people have learned and will continue to learn as this ecosystem evolves. And, and just to build on that also, because we just listed like everything that you trust and like cast aspersions on them. Uh, it's also worth keeping in mind, like there's a spectrum of trustworthiness on these different layers. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the last year, just going off my subjective experience, DNS has proven to be one of the awful ones. So being a browser extension has proven to be, uh, it saved a lot of people money. Um, we saw with the Ether Delta, uh, Ether Delta got hacked and they had in-browser wallets and so all their users that logged in during that time got their funds drained. So, uh, and that's just because they, you know, whatever DNS registrar they were using just got compromised. And uh, we saw a whole bunch of sites get their DNS attacked this last year and then uh, run phishing campaigns right on their home pages. We saw uh, readersdigest.com, Games Workshop, the guys that make uh, Warhammer, uh, all these different sites, they, they were putting this little uh, fake MetaMask pop-up saying, oh, uh, there was a problem, enter your seed phrase. Um, so, you know, so uh, fortunately, we, we have a, a kind of block list uh, infrastructure. So we responded to each of these like within minutes. Uh, so we, we prevented those from causing attacks. But uh, if you're talking about where to store keys, you know, um, you know, uh, I might I might trust the hardware module more than uh, random yes. DNS uh, local storage. The browser yeah. is d a dangerous place to be and a dangerous place to have your keys. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. I'm pretty sure that we've come to the end. Although this timer like keeps starting, like adding minutes to it. I'm not really sure, but I think it's been like 45 minutes. And cool. yeah, yeah. So thank everyone for their time. Uh, really learned a lot on the panel, and it was nice talking to you guys. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Much.